All right, sorry for that little bit of delay. It's always uh, challenging when cords get disconnected and crossed and whatever. Um, but that's part of teaching in a school setting where other people use the room. So today, um, we're going to actually have our last illustrator lecture. Uh, and then on as much as I wanted to have it split where we finished illustrator on Wednesday of this week, we have to jump into the next section, which will be AutoCAD. Uh, so we'll do just a little bit of AutoCAD before spring break. Uh, but I did want to make sure that your assignment was due before spring break, so you don't have to think about it over spring break. So just a, as a quick reminder, that assignment 104, the Charlie Harper drawing, that is due before I start talking on Wednesday. And that means you all can have a nice, relaxing spring break, at least from my class. You know, it's not, it's not me that's causing you the stress. Um, so hopefully you're all looking forward to having a week off, which is good. Comes at a good time in the spring semester. In the fall semester, it's always hard because you get the Thanksgiving break right before and you have two weeks when you come back and it's just chaos. Um, spring break happens at the right time. So uh, we'll enjoy our week off. Today, we're going to talk about architectural diagrams. And I know that this particular lecture is a little bit more geared toward the architects in the room versus the industrial designers that are, that are in here. But a lot of the techniques that I'm talking about still apply. And really what, what, what diagramming is about, it's about getting your, your key ideas out. And so I apologize in advance, because this is a little bit geared toward architecture, um, for those of you that are in industrial design, but recognize my background in architecture. So it's natural for me to try to, to talk through diagramming from an architectural perspective versus an industrial design perspective. So we're going to talk at length about this. And I think we'll start first with what is a diagram in the first place. And you've probably, if you've been in 120, uh, or certainly if you've been in 220, there's no question, there's lots of um, discussion over diagrams. Oh, you need to show me diagrams. I need five different diagrams by next class of your design ideas. And essentially what a diagram is, is it's a way of describing what you're trying to do really simply. So you distill down the major design decision the big thing that I'm going to do, the big picture idea, into one simple drawing. It's not an accurate two-scale drawing. It's something that's simplified that allows a person to understand what is that big idea. I think a good way of kind of talking about it is it's kind of like a one-line joke, where you tell the joke and the punchline's built in. It's like, that's it. That's all there is to it. Here it is. I'm laying it on the table. Same kind of an idea here. We're providing a clear, very easy to understand overview of whatever the project is. So it's meant to be clear. It's meant to be simple. So how do you learn to diagram in the first place? So you're in these classes, and the, the instructors keep saying, I need diagrams. I need diagrams. I need diagrams. You go, I don't even know what a diagram is. How do you learn this? Well, it's all about practicing. And the truth is, a lot of what you sketch in your sketchbook, you should all be keeping a sketchbook anyway, those are diagrams. They're not accurate to scale drawings. You're not busting out AutoCAD and, and doing you know, fancy computer work or anything like that. You're just sketching. You're just getting your ideas out. Those are diagrams. So you can get a lot out of just practicing in your sketchbook over and over and over and over again. And that's going to distill out these ideas. And you're going to practice that diagram. If you're tr struggling with really trying to identify what a diagram is, there's some tricks to helping you out. And I would say, if you try any one of these things, it'll start to feel more like a diagram. Maybe you draw all in black and white. Suddenly, you add some color. That becomes a diagram. And we'll talk about these techniques a little bit more. Maybe you cut things out when you glue in images. That can be a diagram. Maybe you work all in pen. You add some pencil. Maybe you work all in a thick pen, and you add some thin pen. It's just contrast. That's all it takes to start establishing these diagrams. So I pulled out a sketchbook. This was um, my first semester in grad school. This was my sketchbook. And I, I love this picture, not because you can really tell what on earth I was sketching about, because you can't. But notice every single one of the drawings on this page was not done in the sketchbook. They were all drawn somewhere else. And that's totally OK. If you feel more comfortable, if you're drawing on trace, if you, wherever it is, you have the back of a napkin. I mean, we, people always joke about the idea coming off the back of a napkin because you're sitting and eating, and then suddenly you have this bright idea, and it's on the napkin. That's totally OK. You're designers. This stuff pops into your head at random times. Take it, tape it into your sketchbook. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I, I graduated from this style sketchbook to this one, um, which is one of the moleskins. It's called the Japanese fold. And the cool thing about it is it's one continuous piece of paper. 
And so you can just kind of keep drawing. There's never an end to the page and you turn the page. It just kind of keeps going. Uh, and I really like these. I used to carry these religiously um, with me. Now that I'm old, I don't carry it with me anymore. But it was fun when I was doing it. And you can see that my ideas just flowed from one page to the next page, to the next page, to the next page, to the next page. These are all diagrams. This is not something specific. I'm not designing something and measuring or anything like that. This is ideas as I'm starting to put this stuff together. So let's look at some architectural diagram types and then some examples of those types. And I think sometimes it's helpful to kind of break it down into these are major categories. We're going to talk about figure ground or solid void. We'll talk about highlighting. We'll talk about arrows and flow lines. We'll talk about breaking out components of a particular building. We'll talk about text and or typography as a diagram technique. We'll talk about movement. Now, I've separated these out into these specific categories, and I'm going to try to show you examples that are specific to each category. But the truth is that often in diagramming, you end up using multiple techniques and kind of blurring the edges. And on a lot of the examples that I'll show, well, really, they could fall into one or more categories. But I think it's helpful to kind of distill out. These are the main kind of strategies for how you might diagram uh, your work. So we'll start first with something called a figure ground. And if you haven't heard of figure ground, you might have heard of solid and void. It's positive and negative space. It's a contrast. It's a big contrast. We're trying to emphasize a strong contrast in your design process from one thing to another thing. And we emphasize that strong contrast using things that are filled in and things that are empty. This whole idea comes from Gian Battista Noli's Plan of Rome. Uh, this is 1748. This is way too blurry. The, if you see this in its full size, it's actually really cool. You can look at it. They have a, a whole series of these in the Vatican um, that you can take a look at. I'm, blur I'm, I'm zooming in a little bit on a section. Uh, this is the, the section that has Piazza di Spagna and uh, the Piazza del Popolo. And if we look at this carefully, we can kind of, I mean, how many people have been to Rome before? Okay, a few of you, that's good. If you haven't been to Rome, just an FYI, that should be on your bucket list to go. Kind of like when I talk about Machu Picchu, that's a good place to go. Go to Rome. Like, really go to Rome. It's awesome. So. We could tell here that this is obviously a map of a city. Right? I, would, I would bet all of you can kind of get that. What is it really showing us? There's something specific here. Think about what is light and what is dark. Okay, what on this map is light? Tell me something. Well, streets. 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 Great. What else is light? You see anything else besides the streets? Churches, inside a church, OK? Plazas, that kind of stuff. What's dark? Places you can't go into. So this is not actually a plan of Rome. This is a diagram of Rome. It is telling us what are places that you can go publicly, where can you walk, and where can't you walk. So it's not actually Rome, it's the public and private spaces of Rome. And so the cool thing here is that you're actually seeing not just, I'm zooming in a little bit more, not just the streets, because there are a lot of public places like churches in Rome that you can just walk into. So something like the Pantheon right here, we said that the plaza around the Pantheon is obviously, the streets around it are obviously public, they're white, but then inside, the Pantheon itself is also public. You can go there. You can walk there. So it's an interesting way of thinking about Rome, the city of Rome. This same strategy is used very frequently. Now you'll start seeing it all over the place. So here we are in a museum. We've got the places that you can access in white or light. And we've got the places you can't access, the back archives, that kind of stuff in blue. So it's contrast. This is where we can go. This is where we can't go. It's not limited to just public and private, just places I can go and places I can't go. You can look at it in a far broader sense. It's just contrast. It's showing the difference between one thing and another thing. So this is Rem Koolhaas's uh, uh, Office of Metropolitan Architecture. This is a library competition that they did a long time ago. And you can tell that it's a long time ago from the pictures, that this is old. 
This was the library that they designed. This is a model of their library. This is one of their study models back when they didn't have laser cutters to cut things out. You cut things out by hand as they were studying through this design. And this is fundamentally about a strong contrast. Does this look familiar? Yeah. It's a solid and void diagram. So what is it showing us? Well, it's not showing us the public and private places of the library. Instead, it's showing us where are the books or the contents of the library held versus where are the open spaces where you can read the books. So it's what is the stacks and what is the place you can inhabit and enjoy reading the books. And so these happen to all be in section. So we're looking at slices through the building. So this would be vertical and we'd be, be able to inhabit these spaces. They also did a series of drawings that are a series of plans as we go up. So you can see on each successive plan what is open and what is where the books are housed, or the movies, or whatever it is that they're housing in here. I'm thinking it's books. I don't know this project. I've never been here. But you get the idea. It's a contrast. It's one thing versus another thing. And it's a great diagrammatic technique. Uh, next series of images will be out of this book, The Endless City. And it's a lot of the same strategy, where they're breaking out. This time, they're using colors to define certain regions of a city. But it's the same basic strategy. I like this one, because you see what the city is, how it's organized. And then you see a reorganization of the city with all the little shapes lined up next to each other. It's kind of fun. So that was solid and void, or figure ground. The next one is going to be highlighting. This is where we're highlighting differences in the design framework, some big thing that you want to draw attention to. It can be done in model form, where we're highlighting a specific piece of a model. And it can be done in drawing form, where we're coloring in. You can think of it as like color coding. I want to draw your attention here, so I make it a different color. So let's look at some examples. Here we have the old building versus the new building. Notice that there's specific colors. So if you squint at this, is your eye drawn to anything specific? Yeah, it's drawn to the color. So we can see in here, OK, the red means something. OK, it looks like it's the new building level 1 and level 2. The blue, new building ground level. OK, so that's clearly different than level 1 and level 2. And the old building is all yellow. So that's different again. So it's about identifying areas of the building with a little pop of color. Another example here, same drawing over and over again, colored in for different purposes. This is what's going on here. This is the office space. This is the building support space. These are the management facilities, et cetera. It's actually kind of interesting. I was looking at this um, as I was preparing to give the lecture today. And there's a lot of overlap <laughs> in these squares. So I don't quite know what they were going for. But you get the idea. They're color coding something specific. So you guys know I, I really like Alex Holgraf's work. I showed a bunch of his portfolio pages uh, in the portfolio lecture. This is his, uh, one of his projects. This is visualizingarchitecture.com is his website. He has a lot of really great graphics. It's a good place to get inspired about creating good quality graphics. Um, this is one of his diagrams. Notice his choice of colors. The red and the green are complementary colors. So remember that from last class. Just trying to. Anyway, he's showing two distinct views through his building, these slices that are in this building. And we're seeing them in plan view on the left and in kind of perspective view on the right. And he's understanding that there's an association between the circle and the view and why the building is split. So we're, we get a sense for what's happening in the building based on this diagram. Is this an accurate, drawn, perfectly to scale thing? No. It's an idea. It's a concept. This is why we slice the building into these two locations. Another set from the same project. In this context, he's showing major views of the building. And we can actually see, like if we look at this one, for example, of course, I have red as my highlight color here. Um, let me see if I can change that real quick. Nope. Too difficult. I don't know where to change the color. So uh, anyway, the blue section right here is showing the view. So we're standing here looking that direction. And that corresponds to this view down below. So same thing here. The view's going off right there. There's our view. Here, it's going off that direction. There's our view there. Does that kind of make sense? So there's a reference between the diagram that's above and what's happening below. And then, of course, he, he talks about what's happening 
in um, text form as well. Another example here, pretty simple. These are my basic shapes. This is how they're overlapping. This is then forming my general uh, design for the particular building. So I like to throw this one up here because it is certainly an example of color coding. The main theater, this is the 5,000 th seat theater, it's in purple, and we've got the, uh, you know, the foyer and the gallery and that's in blue, and the backstage is in light green, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? To me, this is kind of like a unicorn threw up all over the drawing. Like there's just too much going on. And I think this is one of the things you have to be careful of when you're doing color coding. It's way too easy to just get the whole rainbow out there and I'm gonna color code everything all in one drawing. This, you become desensitized to this. Like it's just this big colorful blob. If we separated this out into a series of small little vignette drawings, and in each one there was the same color but highlighting a different thing, it would be far more effective. So you have one little drawing and you have the theater highlighted. Maybe it's in red. Then you move on to the next and you see the, uh, you know, the um, I don't know, the Civic Plaza underneath. And that's highlighted in red. So you're using the same color over and over in a series of drawings, rather than this, where you have the, you know, the rainbow effect. So I think that's, that's something to be aware of in the color coding, is you can go too far and have too much of it. This one, of course, combines other things like flow arrows and whatever. We'll get to that a little bit later on. They were, they were obviously trying to cram everything, their whole diagram, into one little drawing. And that's certainly, if you don't have a lot of board space to spread these things out, that's certainly a strategy. Another example here, I have no idea what they're trying to show me in this drawing. But I do understand that there's a distinct difference between whatever is blue and whatever is red. So by the color code itself, I understand, oh, there is definitely something different there. Same thing here. We're using blue and red again. There are two distinct sides to whatever this building is. The building happens in the middle. One side is the blue side. The other side is the red side. Now on this one, I happen to know what, what the contrast is. Uh, this was a project done on a river's edge in a city. It happened to be in Rome. The red side is the city, the dense, the bustle of the, the city and the activity there. The blue side is the river, more relaxed, nature setting, etc. So you're seeing the contrast between those and the building straddles between the two. Another example here, I'm going to skip on to the next slide. Um, this was a whole series of diagrams. This is what I was talking about, where you might separate out and show the same drawing multiple times and then color code separately on each drawing. So you're not seeing them all crammed together. For me personally, I think I would have stuck with just one color repeating over and over again, rather than still going through the rainbow. This is better than the, the unicorn drawing, but it's still not quite as good as it could be. Uh, and then they have some where they start to combine them together. And I get their strategy. This happened to be about how these modules can, can change over time. You can switch from an office module to a you know, hotel module, et cetera, and the building changes over time. I get what you're trying to say. But again, it can be a little bit clouded and a little bit muddled over time. We move back to an Alex Holgreff. And again, this is about color coding. He's highlighting specific pieces of the building. So we can see, oh, the red piece is highlighted. And this is a good example of consistency of color, where we can really quickly see what he's trying to show us and how this building develops. And you can see that it's, it's kind of like a component drawing, where we're putting one piece, we're adding a piece, we're adding a piece, we're adding a piece. But it's still the colors are doing a great job at identifying what it is that he wants us to look at as part of this particular drawing. So the next technique that I'll talk about is arrows or flow lines as part of a showing movement, showing how something moves through space, how something breathes. It could be people, it could be animals, it could be air, it could be a lot of things. It's the thing that moves through the drawing. I like this as a good segue into this, this drawing on the, on the right here. And if I can draw your attention to that for just a second, we've got a little number one, and that's where we're supposed to start right here. And I think this is so subtly done. It doesn't involve big arrows or anything fancy. It's just a line that starts off thick right at one. And as it comes along, you see that part of the line goes down to the lower section of seats, a thin little line. But the bulk of the people continue on and go up to the next level. And so we get right here to this level, and a group of people peel off. The line gets a little bit thinner. We come up to the next level right here. Another group of people exit. 
the line gets a little bit thinner, and then we end with the people going to the top. So we get a sense for, of all these people moving up this set of stairs, each time there's a, there's a landing, part of the line splits away. So we have an understanding of quantity of people and how certain groups of people end up pulling off as they walk up through the space. Didn't involve any fancy arrows, didn't involve any fancy text or descriptions. We can clearly see what's happening as people are, are climbing up that set of stairs. So I'm going to tell you right now, anybody ever heard of Takaharu and Yui Tezuka or the floating roof house? I know you have, but be quiet for now. So if I were to tell you right now that there's a house that these architects designed called the floating roof house, how would you draw it? What if you had to diagram it? Try right now. A lot of you have sketchbooks out. Flip the page over from your handout today. Try to draw it. What would it look like to you? Remember, a diagram's quick. It's easy. It doesn't have to be precise. You're trying to get a major idea out. like what I'm seeing. I think you guys are on the right track. So most of what I'm seeing has something to do with a roof. Oops, sorry. Darn it, I jumped ahead. You didn't see that, right? Most of what you did was some kind of a roof, something like that, and then maybe some, some walls or something underneath, and that there was a gap in between the two. Some of you had little arrows like this. You know, all pretty effective. I happen to know what the building is. I happen to have, uh, have seen it. But the way that Takaharu and Yui Tezuka decided to draw it was like this. Very close to what you all drew. Right? The difference here is that they removed the walls. And uh, uh, Takaharu happens to be really, really good at sketching. So uh, it was actually it was pretty fun. They were, um, they were a visiting pair. They're, they're Japanese. And they came over to teach a studio at Berkeley when I was in grad school. And the first day that we met him while they were there, he just sat back and let all of us talk. And he was doodling like the whole time. And he was on his coffee cup. Like he didn't even have a sketchbook. He was just drawing. And when he was done, you know, it was like, OK, it's time to leave. He put his coffee cup down on the table and walked out the door. He had drawn every single one of us in like cartoon form and characters and whatever all around his coffee cup. And then he just set it there and left. He was really cool. Anyway, this is their diagram of what the floating roof house was about. So we can understand here that there's some form of a hillside. He's drawing a section line like that, et cetera. We can understand that there's some kind of a roof, and that, that, that whatever the hillside is or, or the, the slope comes through the building itself, and the roof floats above. So let's jump forward a slide and get a little bit more technical. That was the diagram. Now we get into a more technical drawing. We have the building itself. And again, this is kind of a sectional perspective drawing. We've got the hillside here. And we've got the idea that this roof extends and that it really blends through the landscape. The landscape goes through the house. And let's take a look at the actual building once it was built. We have the hillside. And the building can actually open up completely. And the roof floats above. It's a pretty neat house. We won't talk about Title 24 energy codes or anything like that. But it, it's, it's, it's neat. You can open up those doors and get that house completely open and have the hillside flow through the building. Even the end of the house opens up completely. So we've got the cantilevered roof here. Obviously, you need to have some building facilities, like bathrooms and, and what have you. Those are the closed-in portions of this. 
but it really breathes, the nature and the landscape breathes right through this house. I think it's a good example of a diagrammatic technique. So another example here, these are view corridors identified by those lines. Some kind of interconnectedness going through this plaza. Again, not my project, not exactly sure what's going on there. Some kind of a gathering space highlighted in red. So there's a combination. We've got the highlight, we've got the color coding, but we also have the arrows about how this is looking out to those other areas. Example here of airflow through a building. Now I happen to have a little gripe about this particular drawing. I think it's really nicely done, but the truth is that the air, unless there was a really strong wind, the air wouldn't blow this direction, especially this one. That, that doesn't work because cold air wouldn't be coming in from above and going out low. It doesn't, doesn't work. Cold air comes in here and goes out there. That's what happens naturally. It heats up, goes out. So I disagree with the flow of the arrows a little bit on this drawing. I have no idea who did, drew this drawing, so it's okay. Uh, I can trash it, right? But in, in this context, the arrows are really nicely done, and it's showing something moving from one place to another. That makes it a really nice, good diagram. Components, building components. This is where uh, it's, it, you can think of it as an exploded axonometric. It's where we're pulling apart pieces of the building, or we're showing only a few pieces of the building. We're taking the, the wall, the front wall off so we can see inside. We're showing just the structure, those kinds of things. And so it might be something like this. I really like this drawing. I think it's, it's subtly done. We have some kind of a core, this gray object that's the, the heart of the building. And then we have a skin, this flowing white skin up above that fits down over the building. But we can tell by the perspective and the way it's drawn, and especially the little dotted lines that come down, that that shell is supposed to slide down over the top of the building. So this is a diagram because we're obviously the, the white shell isn't just floating up there in space in the real building. It comes down over the building and is part of it. But we've chosen to show it where we've lifted it up. And by lifting it up, we're highlighting that as a different piece. So this is a way of separating out or teasing out the components of a building. So same example here, we have a, a little column grid structure showing. We have a skin that's separate from the structure, etc. Anybody seen or heard of the Sendai MediaTek? A few of you? Very cool building. This is the diagram that Toyo Ito did of the building. Now, I don't speak Japanese. I can't read whatever this says, which is a good thing because I can still look at the diagram and have an understanding about what's happening in this particular building. So just by looking at the diagram, I can tell that there's, some, there's some, something going on with these floor plates that go across. OK, those are probably the floors of the building. And then there's these mesh net structures that go up through the building. Well, those must have something to do with circulation or, or structure or something. So I can get a sense for the building by just looking at this diagram. Hopefully it doesn't say anything bad, if you can read Japanese. Hopefully it doesn't say anything bad. So just the diagram, I can tell a lot of information. Same building. Here's another set of diagrams based on it. These are those solid void diagrams. This is where things are kept in the building. This is where the public space is in the building, etc. So we're combining diagrammatic techniques. We just did the solid void. Then we get into a little bit more technical diagram. This is still diagram. We have our floor plates highlighted in that greenish color. We have a blue skin that's applied on the building. And then we have a series of tubes that go through the building. It's a pretty good diagram. A little bit more information, a little bit more computer modeling. This has to do with the deformation of those tubes and how they work. And here we are in the actual building. So this is the ground floor of the building. All of those tubes that puncture through the building provide the building services for every one of the floors. So it's the structure of the building. That's how all the floor plates are held up, floor to floor to floor. It is the circulation. It's how you get up from the ground floor to the multiple floors. You can actually see um, in this tube right there, you can see the set of stairs working its way up like that. This one here has the elevator going up and down. This one here, if you look carefully, has a pipe right there. It's probably a water pipe or a sprinkler pipe. I'm guessing sprinkler pipe by the size and the fact that it's a museum. You don't need that much water. It's not residential. 
Uh, could be a waste pipe, but that's going up through the building. So these twisting tubes become the primary service for this particular building. If we look at it from the outside, there it is. We can clearly see floor plate, floor plate, floor plate, and the tubes come up through the building itself. So do you see the connection between the diagram, that early stage diagram, and what the final building ended up like? So it's again, it's about that fundamental idea. So I have to, I love this building, and I have to go on a tangent that has nothing to do with digital tools, but it's fun to talk about anyway. So I, I really, I love construction, I love materials, I love how they apply in buildings and that sort of thing. This is a great example. So let's imagine for a second that you were on the top floor of this building, and there was a fire that broke out on, say, this middle story right here. Now remember, those, those tubes are your way out. One of those was the stairwell going down. So you have to evacuate the building. The glass in this floor that goes around this tube has to be a fire rated glass. You have to be able to get out from that glass. So Toyo Ito needed to find a material that would allow that fire rating so that we can get out and not burn ourselves alive, not cook ourselves in an oven as we go through that, but maintain that clear for the rest of the time. Typically, firewalls are made out of like drywall or brick or concrete or, or something that's, you know, a fireproof building material. So what, what they developed is a very special set of glass. Now, the other, the other factor is if there was a raging fire outside of the glass, you wouldn't want to do this and burn your hand, right? So you need to be safe on the inside, too. So they developed a material that's called an intumescent gel that resists fire. It's clear. It's transparent. And you can have a raging fire on one side of the glass, and on the inside of the glass, there's no wires, there's nothing in the glass. It's just the gel in between the two layers of glass. The inside is actually cool to the touch. Pretty cool product. So that's what happens in this. Now, he also had the choice. That gel could remain transparent when it was exposed to heat, or it could frost over and turn cloudy when it was exposed to heat. Now, if you were designing the building, what would you choose? If you wanted people to stay calm, you'd probably want that to turn frosted. So the gel in this building does turn frosted. So I know that has nothing to do with digital tools, but at the same time, it's kind of one of those unique stories that makes you understand why architecture is so important. So we can do these kinds of things. Yeah? Uh, was it designed specifically for this building? No, the material existed before this building. This is just a perfect example of how the material can be used to do something really cool. So if you as a designer have an understanding of what these kinds of materials are, you can choose to do things like this and push those design limits. And I think that's part of what makes this a really good case study of that kind of material. If you're interested, um, look up intumescent paint or whatever on YouTube. They have, uh, they have examples of painting a wall, like a piece of plywood with intumescent paint, and then paint, having a regular plywood wall, and they light them on fire, and you see how long one lasts versus the other. They're, it's pretty cool. Anyway. Total side note, fun story, had to share. Another example here of just the tube and, and structural stresses on a particular tube. Now, I apologize, this image is a little bit blurry, but you still get the sense of here's my building, and I've broken apart the various pieces of the building, and I can see what's happening inside. This diagram is about whatever the building and then these colored little jewels that are inside the building itself. So this could easily be the, the color coding Another example here uh, of the structural grid, final building, and then different uh, drawings based on that grid. Subtle gradient showing a heating and cooling system for this particular building. Pantheon, I mentioned earlier, and I brought that one up. Uh, this is the diagram of the Pantheon. We see a lot of information about the Pantheon here. It's certainly a section view. But notice the circle that's inscribed right in the center. This is fundamentally what this building is about in the first place. So the idea here is that the dome is a perfect 150 feet. It's 150 feet across. It's 150 feet tall. So you could put a 150-foot ball or sphere inside the building, and it would fit perfectly. Anybody been there, been here? OK, a couple of you. Again, bucket list item, you need to go here. OK, and when you go here, you have to make me a promise right now that you will just sit there for like 45 minutes. So worth it. Just sit there and enjoy it. We don't have buildings like this, not at all. So here's, I got to show a few pictures of it. 
There it is from the outside. Not the most impressive building from the outside. However, from the inside, I would say it's one of the most spectacular buildings ever made or ever built. Um, just a little bit of perspective here. We have the people. We have the first set of columns. Notice you're not even seeing the dome yet. So let's uh, let me see if I have. Let me go back a couple slides just for perspective. So here in the section view, notice the tops of the columns are right here, right? Right there. In that photograph view, there's the tops of the columns. This was nowhere even close to halfway up. It's about a quarter of the way up in terms of size. So this is just so much larger than the spaces we have here that we're used to seeing. So go spend your time. It should be on your bucket list, too. I'm filling up your bucket list, I know, but bear with me. I promise it'll be worth your time. Uh, sometimes it's about one versus the other. Actually, this is probably going to the next um, grouping, where we have um, something that happens in one context versus something that happens in another context. This time, it's a diurnal cycle, so it's what it looks like in the day versus what it looks like in the night. Typography. Using text or typography to indicate what's the intended use of that particular area of the building. I think sometimes it's easier to kind of see some examples of how this works. This is, again, an Alex Holgraf set of drawings. And instead of identifying what's happening or color coding, this is the lobby, this is the classroom, et cetera, he's just used big fonts to say, this is lobby. This is adjustable seating. This is the classroom, whatever. So you see how the type is then serving as the diagram. So we have the same view. He's just showing what's happening in the spaces by that big text. I think this is a really successful version of that. Another example here where we've got a stage. We've got the fly above. And we have an understanding of where that stage is because it says stage. Another set of, of pieces here. This was a, a library diagram. So you see that what's happening in those various sections get highlighted by text. Movement. Show how people or inhabitants move through space over time. So you can say, well, wait a minute. Didn't we already talk about flow lines and movement that way? Yeah, this is just a little bit different. Uh, I separate it out because it's a slight variant. Could you do this with arrows? Sure. Sometimes you do it with little footpaths. Sometimes you just do it with a series of lines over and over again. So here's an example here of how something is moving through the space, drawn with a series of simple lines. All right, we're going to look at something called cab spotting. And I think it's easier to see it in its live form. OK, so once we, uh, once we start it here, when you know what this is, just raise your hand. You know, OK? Got one, two, three. Guess what? You've all been here. Four, five, six, seven, eight. There we go. Most of you got it by now. So what this is, is this is something that the Exploratorium did, oh, probably uh, 10 or 12 years ago. And they, they tried to create a diagram of the city of San Francisco. And the way that they did this diagram is they tracked the GPS locators of all the cabs that were running in San Francisco. This is pre-Uber and Lyft and stuff, right? Where every, every mode of communication or um, transportation, if you wanted to get from point A to point B, was primarily taxi or bus. So they were tracking the taxis. And you can see that over time, we're only at about 1 in the afternoon right now in a 24-hour period. We have a really good sense for the city and where the streets are just by tracking how the cabs are moving through. There are some really obvious dark paths. The path going down, for example, goes to the airport. A lot of cabs going to the airport. Path going off to that side would be Bay Bridge. Path going north would be Golden Gate. So we can see all of that. You can see Market Street really clearly. You can see where Golden Gate Park is, all based on how the cars are moving through the streets. So is this actually a map of San Francisco? No. It's a diagram of how people move through San Francisco. So using the same strategy, uh, when I was doing my thesis, I did flight pattern diagrams, same strategy, where we see a whole series of lines drawn. Uh, that was out of SFO. 
That then got adapted into how people move through the airport. This was again in SFO. I did my thesis around SFO. It's so funny because I had no interest in that large of a project and somehow I got roped into doing a thesis on the airport. Go figure. Um, this was when Terminal 2 was completely closed, so it didn't exist. So Terminal 2 it would be in that blank space off to one side. It was just Terminal 1 and Terminal 3. Most of the air traffic and, and the people traffic went out of Terminal 3. Uh, and so you can see how people moved through this particular space. This was a little set of drawings that I did. There's a, a blown up view of it. Sometimes it, this is a, a plan view of how you're angling so that you can't see past one corner to the next corner. Simple site diagram. There's obviously some form of a river that runs through here. The site then passes across that particular river. So it's again, very simple, very clean. This was my thesis. Um, we were asked to diagram our thesis. This, the first one, this was a two-sided card. The first one was the one on the left. This is what I thought I was doing for my thesis when I went in to, to start the thesis. The thesis um, in architecture school is a year-long project. So you, and actually, mine was a little bit longer because I started it the semester before. They had an option to do a summer, an extra summer session with it. And so this is what I thought I was going to do for my thesis. This was my thought process. All was good. And then I started getting into my thesis, and it turned into that. Such is life, right? Another example here of people, the dotted lines showing people moving through the space. There we go. And then how it transforms the building. So it's a two-part diagram. Uh, another series here, this is showing a lot of other things moving, things like sun or wind, environmental factors across a building. This one is another one of those catch-all things. I think the drawing itself is actually a very beautiful drawing, or rendering, I should say. I think the um, arrows are the most cartoonish garbage <laughs> that I've ever seen, for lack of a better term. Uh, so if, if, especially the raindrops and the sun, somehow those two just, I don't know. Um, so if you're going to do this, <laughs> let the beautiful drawing stand out and find another way to diagram it, please. But it's a good example because we're seeing lots of stuff happening. The evaporation of water, the rain coming down, the sun coming down. Etc. all in those airs, arrows and, and movement. Last one I'll talk about is the transformation. This is how it's typically done. What if we did it this way? You could call it the what if diagram. So it shows what is before, what is after. So in this sense here, we have three skyscrapers. What if we laid them all down? We have the typical back of house. We have the chamber and we have the front of the house. What if we did it vertically instead? So it's, this is how it's done. What if we did it this way? Here's my typical building. What if I cut it and I reversed one of the sections? So it's usually a two part. It usually takes two drawings to do it. But it's a good way of identifying this is what's typical. This is what changed. OK, so we're going to switch over. We'll take a little break. Um, let's come back at 9.05. And then I'll do the demo portion, which is the last bit. We'll talk about brushes and, and stuff in Illustrator to try to do these diagrams. OK? All right, so we're going to get started with the second half of um, the lecture today. Uh, today, we'll, we're going to go through diagramming techniques in Illustrator. Um, and so to do this, I'm asking that you work with an architectural building or project. Um, for those of you that are in industrial design, if you want to try to do this around an industrial design product, I, I'm OK with you experimenting with it a little bit. Uh, I don't have a lot of good advice on <laughs> the right strategy for that. But I'm trying to adapt and make sure that it, it's relevant for you guys as well. Um, so in, uh, basically, you can pick uh, a historical building, a major historical building. What you're looking for is plan section views rather than a photograph uh, to work from. You, what you choose is up to you uh, if there's a building that you're particularly interested in. The other option is if you have a project that you've actually done and you want to try to diagram that project, I'm OK with that as well. Uh, but again, you kind of need plan section views, that, that sort of thing, uh, to set this up. So I'm going to do this using the Kimball Art Museum, which I think is a, is, a, is a good example. It's a good way of kind of showing some simple diagrammatic techniques. Uh, and I'll walk you through it. Uh, you're going to be doing two diagrams total. So one should be a section view. One should be a plan view. The diagrams tend to be a little bit different. That's why I'm asking you to do two different views. 
If you're doing an industrial design product, it would be the same kind of thing. You're looking for something that's an elevation or, or a section view versus something that's kind of a plan view looking down on it uh, in, that, in that context. So um, when I went and did my search, I'm not doing a Creative Commons search because I need uh, some kind of a probably a copywritten <laughs> drawing to work from. I'm not going to actually use the drawing. I'm just going to draw on top of it. Uh, and so I did my search. I made sure that I went into my tools and made sure that the image that I start from is large enough. So I bumped up the size a little bit. Uh, here's an example uh, of the Kimball Art Museum. I'll, I can work using this example, I believe. Let me go ahead and visit it there. Of course, I can't use that one. I love it when you think you have something and then it doesn't work. This one's kind of already a diagram, so I, I'm not super excited about that, but we'll open that in a new tab just in case. Here we go. This one could work. Of course, all the ones that I'm choosing aren't working, right? Probably just see if I have one already downloaded from last semester. So <laughs> bear with me. Uh, for whatever reason, the image, the uh, internet is not liking me right now. Okay, so I do have I do have some here. I have the Pantheon as well. Okay, so I'm just going to use one of those that I already have. What I'll do is I'll get into Illustrator. I'm going to create a new drawing here. I'll use print as my size. And I'm just going to go with the letter size. But I'll probably switch to landscape. I'll also change my units into inches, which is good. Um, my color mode here, because I chose print, is in CMYK. Remember, now that we know color modes, et cetera, uh, that would be as if I was going to print it. If I, were, if I wanted it to be uh, something that I was posting online only, I could switch this over to RGB color. Remember, additive color versus subtractive color. Uh, it doesn't really matter for what we're doing. And of course, it'll convert either way. So I'm going to assume right now, because it's a drawing, because I'd end up putting it on a board, that it would end up being a CMYK. That's why I'm assuming it, even though for your purposes, you're just going to post it. Um, but it doesn't really matter. OK, so the rest of these settings are all fine. I'll go ahead and click on Create. And that gives me my uh, 8 half by 11 drawing here. First thing I need to do is bring in the image file, the sample image file that I downloaded. But I'm going to pay attention to my layers here. So right now, I only have layer 1. We'll go ahead and bring this in on layer 1, but I'll end up doing my diagram on a separate layer. So I'll go into File and then Place. And I'll go to my flash drive and find the section view. it is. And we'll go ahead and place it in. There it is. It's a little bit too large, although I'm really only concentrating on this one piece of the drawing. So it's OK if it's a little bit, uh, it goes off the page just a little bit like that. So like I said, it's on layer 1. I'm going to go ahead and create a new layer. This is layer 2. Let me rename this for diagram. And I'm going to number it because I'm going to end up doing multiple diagrams today. Uh, and so I have that set as diagram 1. And on this layer 1, I'm going to go ahead and lock it so that I can't accidentally do anything to it. I'm not going to move it, et cetera. Sometimes people will want to um, change the opacity of the image ahead of time so it's a little bit uh, lighter. I can come down here in my properties, and I can change the opacity down a little bit. Just makes it a little bit lighter. Ultimately, I'll probably end up turning this off altogether. So we can leave it like that. Probably. Trying to get just enough so you guys can see it, but not too much. Yeah, that's all right. I'll go back to my layers, and I'm going to lock that layer 1 so that I can't select it anymore. And I'll work on my diagram 1 layer. So now one of the, the neat things about the Kimball Art Museum is how light enters the space. And so if we jump back to the, some of the, the views here, we can see something like this here. The light actually comes through a center skylight bounces off of these little reflectors and back up onto the ceiling. 
to provide a very uniform light in the space. That's one of the big features uh, of the Kimball Art Museum. And so it's worth kind of taking a few looks at these pictures here. You can get a pretty good sense for how it washes back on the ceiling. So if I were diagramming this, how the light enters the space is kind of the key piece that I want to talk about, the key piece that I want to show. So that's what I'm going to diagram. And so we're seeing it here in its context. I probably need a little bit of, of context before I actually draw the diagram because I'm not going to end up using the, the background image here. So let me use the pen tool and I'm going to trace quickly over this arc here. That. This is of course not perfect, yeah, something like that. And I could I could go back and I could make my adjustments. Oops, sorry about that. To some of these tangent lines, to get the arc right, etc. It's not essential that I spend all my time, you guys watching me make that perfect. It's close enough for, for my purposes. I'm going to take that piece. I'm going to copy it. So I'll go to Edit, Copy, and then Edit, Paste. And then I'm going to right click on it and say Transform. And I'm going to reflect it vertically so that I get the other half. And of course, this drawing isn't even, which would be nice. But again, it doesn't really matter because I'm drawing it um, anyway. So there it is. I probably need some floor. So I could come down here and give myself a little bit of floor. Like that. Last thing I would need are these little arcs. So same thing. I'll go with my pen tool. We'll start right there. Click, hold, drag. There's the end. We'll come down, click, hold, drag for my tangent. We'll go to right there. And once again, I will uh, copy it, edit, copy, and then edit, paste. Oops. Helps if I select the whole thing. Edit, copy, edit, paste. Right click, transform, reflect. And there's the other half. So I was just really quickly building out some context. That would then allow me to turn off everything but this. So now it's time to start thinking about how am I going to diagram how the light enters the space. And I could use a variety of techniques for that purpose. So I'm going to go ahead and create another layer so that I can lock my drawing. And I'm going to work on layer 3 here. And in terms of figuring that out, the first option would be to do it with an arrow. So I could start with the pen tool. I could start up high here as if I were the sun. I could come down, bounce off of this, bounce off of that, and then come down into the space, something like that. Now obviously it doesn't look right yet because I have a fill color, not a stroke color. So let me flip so that I have a stroke color. And then let me change the stroke color to be something other than black. So let me come down here into kind of a yellowish color for the sunlight. I probably need to thicken up my stroke. So let's go ahead and show my stroke options here. Um, sometimes you need to actually open up the stroke menu. So I'm going to go to Window and then Stroke. If I can find it, there it is. I don't have all of my options showing by default. So let me go ahead and click on these little lines, the flyout menu, and say Show Options. It gives me all of my options here. So at this point, we can beef up the size or the thickness of the, the line, something like that. And it's really bugging me that this is coming over that direction. This needs to come back more like that. There we go. And so when we start to look at my options with this, um, we can do a couple different things. One, we can obviously change the weight. You just saw me make it a little bit thicker. Next thing that we can do, we talked about caps and corners before. But I could make it a dashed line if I want. So I can check the box for dashed line. And that's going to become a dashed line rather than a solid line. It's an option. I can customize what the dash looks like. So I could say, if I wanted it to be a bunch of little squares, I could say six points by six points. 
and that would make a bunch of le little even little squares because my line thickness is six. I could do a 12 point and a six point. There's a 12 point and a six point, etc. I could get more complex here. I could say a 12, a six, a six, uh, and a 12, and suddenly we can create a different pattern in the lines if we wanted to. Again, all of that's optional, just something to point out. I'll go back to being solid. The next thing down here is something called arrowheads. You have to be a little bit careful here because sometimes these can end up looking really cartoonish. Um, some of the arrows look OK. Um, so a couple things. One, I started here. Therefore, that's the first one. And I ended here. So if I didn't, <laughs> the light's not going up. So this one should probably be set to none. And this one should probably be set to the arrow. And so I could put the arrow there. Again, looks a little bit cartoonish to me. If we come down here a little bit more, there are some arrows that look a little bit more natural. Something like that might be reasonable. If you're worried about the size of the arrow and you wanted the arrow to be smaller or larger, you can change the scale of the arrow. So I could say I wanted that arrow to be a little bit smaller, and it becomes a little bit smaller. Or I wanted the arrow to become a little bit larger. and it becomes a little bit larger. So I'll go ahead and I'll leave that at 100%. The other thing you can do is there are arrows, but there's also tails. So you can put a tail on the arrow if you wanted to. Again, be careful. It can start to look really cartoonish. Um, there are a few other things, like the, the dots and, and what have you. Instead of an arrow, if you wanted to point to something and have a dot on it, you want to have a little. Uh, leader line, you can, you can set that up as well. So I'm just showing you that those exist. There are some really awful ones like, <laughs> like that that I probably wouldn't use. Just saying it. Um, so anyway, you can, you can play around with some of these. Um, some of them are just hideous. Anyway, um, so those are all available for you guys to use. The other option is, of course, to stick with just the plain line and to draw your own arrow. So I could come down here, I have that line, I could come to my pen tool, and I could say, OK, I'm going to go ahead and draw my own arrow because I like the look of that arrow a little bit better, for example. So you can always do that. Sometimes you want this line to have a little bit of character to it. And we can do that using something called the brushes. And we haven't explored brushes too much just yet. Um, brushes are available using the brush window. So let me go to Window and then Brushes. And these brushes, there's a few that are loaded by default, but essentially they can transform what a, what a line looks like. Uh, here's one that is a charcoal feather. And that line can start to become a little bit more sketchy, for example. There are a lot of other options that are built in here um, for you guys to use. If you want to load more, you can always go to the flyout menu and say open brush library. And when you do that, there are arrows, there's artistic, these are all the the pen, ink, paintbrush, watercolor brushes, et cetera. So you can go through here and play around with it. I'm going to go to artistic, and I'll do the chalk, charcoal, and pencil for a second. This brings up a bunch of different styles. And I can select and then apply any one of these. And I can start to sort out which one uh, do I think would look the best. And so it could be that one, for example. It could be any one of these. Uh, I can also take my arrow head and apply the arrow head to one of these brush dials. And suddenly, I have something that's not quite as computer generated strong graphic, et cetera. So that's certainly one strategy for creating this. The other thing that I could do, if I didn't want to use the brushes, let me go ahead and uh, for illustration purposes here, let me duplicate this layer. And I'm going to apply back to basic on my brush here. But the other option, and we talked about this a little bit before, was that I could take my um, line here and I could apply my profile widths. So if we went back to stroke, there's my profile. Remember, these are all predefined profiles. So I could set up uh, any one of these profiles. Let me make it a little bit thicker so you can see. Depending, 
that can transform the brush a little bit as well, so something like that. We can also adjust the width using the width tool right here. And we can say, you know what, I wanted this to be a little bit fatter, and I wanted it to get skinny by the time it went there. So you can play around with these. Again, another strategy. Sometimes on this sort of thing, instead of having this as dark as it is on top of everything, putting a little bit of transparency on it or opacity wouldn't be a bad idea. So here's my opacity. I might say that instead of 100%, I have it just a little bit transparent. And that might help in terms of how it's showing. So again, these are all about looks and strategies. Today, my, my goal is to show you the strategies um, rather than spend the time and make it look perfect. You guys will make it look perfect. I'm just trying to show you strategies. OK, so that was the arrow strategy, where I'm showing the light as an arrow. Maybe I want to show it as a gradient instead. So in that scenario, let me go ahead. I'll turn this off, create another uh, layer to work on here. And in this scenario, I need to start with a shape. So I'm going to draw where I want the light to come in. So we'll come along here. We'll work along this edge. And when I get down to, we'll say about there, I'll come across. Like that. We'll come up to there. And so I've drawn the shape that I want to fill in. Let me go ahead and flip this so you can see it. Right, there's the, there's the light. I probably need to do a little bit of tweaking. You know, something like that. I might also change the layer order so that this ended up behind my, uh, my diagram layer, which is going to put the black on top of, of this. It helps cover up the, the edges. They don't have to be quite as perfect that way. And so this right now is a little bit on the ugly side. So instead of doing this, I want to change it to have a gradient to it. So I'm going to go to Window and then Gradient. I'm just going to bring up this gradient tool, tool pad here. And with the gradient, I want to assign some colors here. So this yellow, I'd like to have as one of my colors. Let me drag that down there. And as I do that, we're going from yellow now to white. But we're going in the wrong direction. It's a linear gradient, which is good. But we want to change that so that it's going from the top down to the bottom. And so if I deselect here, you see that my light's coming in. And as it comes in, it's feathering out as it goes down. So I'm showing how that light enters the space. Now, if I wanted the yellow to end up being a little bit stronger until maybe here, all I have to do is change, well, I have to select it first. I just have to change this slider. And we can control where the yellow is versus where the gradient goes to transparent. Does that kind of make sense? So this is just another strategy for showing how the light might enter the space. Maybe I need it to be a little bit more feathered. We can go like that. We can also adjust the opacity down here so that the whole thing is a little bit more transparent. I could take this and I could uh, transform. Let me reflect it. I'm going to do a vertical reflection. Uh, and I'm going to create a copy of it. It gives me a second version which I can then drop in there. And maybe that starts to identify how the light's falling into space. So it's just a little bit different strategy. So unlike the arrows, this time I'm doing it with a gradient. So I have this as kind of my sectional drawing. We'll say, OK, that, that works. Um, you know, Let's see, I'm, I'm doing this all on the fly. Um, the other option on this section, oops, sorry, wrong one. There it is is I could use the typography strategy. So I could say, OK, this is I can say this is the gallery space. So let me um, view, let me just go into properties here. This should get me close enough. Um, let me center that. This is going to have to keep going up. There it is as gallery. And once I have that, I need this to be taller because I need it to take up the whole, the whole space. So let me select it. I'll go to um, type. I'm going to create outlines which makes it actual um, letters. 
And then I can go into my transform, and we can stretch this one up. No, nope. sorry. There we go. And I can say that's all gallery. Um, I probably need another piece of text up here that would be, I don't know, loft, no, light. Let me take it. Same thing, I'm going to go to type, and I'll go to create outlines. Move this into here. And again, I can use my transform. Let me make that a little bit bigger, like that and like that. And so maybe this becomes yellow in its fill color. And maybe this one becomes something something else. Uh, I don't know, we'll leave it as black right now. And I'm doing this with type. Does that make sense? So it's just another strategy to try to identify what's happening uh, in this. Uh, and maybe I end up having to put something up here that says outside, for example. And maybe I put a bunch of outsides. I don't know. I'm making it up on the fly. You get the idea. So that's another strategy. So I'm going to go ahead and turn those off right now. And I'm going to bring in a plan view. So let me press Control-0, and I'll bring in a plan view. I'm going to go to File, and then Place. You'll do this in a separate uh, document here. But uh, I'll just go ahead and do it in the same one. I'll go to File, and then Place. And I'll bring in, I have the Pantheon plan, so we'll use that one. And it's miniature. All right, so there it is. So I'm not going to uh, redraw this. I'm going to use this drawing. You guys don't need to watch me trace over it. Uh, I'm just going to use this as it is. But the, the idea here is that I want to chart how people are moving into and out of the space. And so I could start and create another layer here. I'll lock the background. And I could start, let me do this in, say, red. That. And I could start with the pen tool. And I can say, OK, uh, they're going to come up here. And this, of course, ideally would be done using uh, actual observation. But you guys don't get to go to the Pantheon right now to observe, so you have to kind of make it up. Uh, and so this particular person walked through here. They stood right at the center there, and they looked at it. Let me flip this so you can see this as a line instead. There it is. They looked for a little bit. They wandered over to here. They looked in this little niche. OK, that's interesting. Maybe they came back here. They sat on the bench for a little bit, and then they kept going. They walked in between those columns, and they walked out. Then they walked along the front, and then they walked down like that, for example. So I'm imagining how somebody's moving through this particular space. So there's one path. Then I would come back, and I'd say, OK, well, somebody else is going to come in. And this, this person's going to come in, and they're going to they're go this way. And I keep layering up how people move through the space. That person was a quick visit. And that person left. Then we'll come back, and we'll keep working. And kind of like that cab spotting exercise, over time, you start to show how everybody's moving in and out of the space. That person apparently walked through the column. Anyway, so you get the idea. So I would spend time doing that. Now, this is an example here where it's kind of hard to see my red lines, and I don't have enough of them yet anyway. But I could change the opacity of the background. So I could take this piece, and I could say, let's drop that opacity down so it's not quite as strong against my red lines, maybe like that. Then we could see more of the red lines. That helps. I could take my red lines, and I could make all of those red lines a little bit thicker. So we can go back to my stroke here, and I can make those a little bit thicker. That would probably help just a little bit. I could say, OK, well, let's take those red lines, and let's make them all dashed. We'll do maybe one point by one point. 
and they become little dotted lines. Okay, this is starting to evolve. The other option, if I didn't like all of these, is I could say this should actually be two point, sorry, two and two. It'll look a little better. There we go. So I have all of those. I could take these lines and I could apply brushes to them. So I could go to that brush instead, turn off the dashed line, and then those can start to be a little bit more painterly. In that sense, they got a little bit too thick, so I might have to drop this to maybe 0.25 point, so they become a little bit more painterly. That could help. So you're going through and you're, you're kind of developing strategy. Now, sometimes you want to be a little bit more specific. And you can do that by actually building your own, if you don't like any of these brushes, you can actually build your own brush. So I'm going to show you how to do that right now. So let's say that instead of having these lines, I wanted to show footprints of how people are moving through. All I have to do is create the set of footprints to start. So let me go in and zoom in here a little bit. I'm going to draw two footprints. So we'll say, okay, let's do the heel of this. You know what, let me make this a little bit bigger. Bear with me. Fill that. All right, so there's one footprint. Let me take this. I'm going to, again, I'm going to copy it and reflect it. So I'll go to edit, copy, edit, paste. I'm going to right click and I'm going to say uh, transform and I'm going to reflect it this time in the horizontal direction. There we go. So I have the second footprint. I'm going to align these so that the stride is about right. So we'll say about like that. And once I have those two pieces set up, let me go to minus there, I'm going to take these two pieces, select them, and then I'm actually going to drag them on top of the brushes window right here. So I'll click and I'll drag over to here. See how it highlights in kind of that blue color? When that happens, I'll let go. And it says, create a new, and I have options here. We're going to do a new scatter brush. And I'll go ahead and say, OK. We'll call this footprints. Oops. And so I have some options here. The size, do I want the size to be fixed, or do I want it to change? Well, the people aren't growing. Their feet aren't growing. So we'll keep it fixed. The spacing, do I want that to be fixed, or do I want them to get closer and further away? Well, chances are their stride's going to be fairly consistent. I could do it a little bit random, but I want to lock it in at maybe only you know, uh, 90 to 110. So we're not doing too much. But people vary their stride just a little bit. It's not perfectly consistent. Um, the scatter, we'll keep that as fixed. The rotation here, I can do it random, or I should be able to do the rotation relative to the path. So it's going to follow the path as opposed to relative to that. We'll keep the rotation fixed, but we're following the path. Uh, our colorization, uh, we'll just do a tints there. And I'll go ahead and say OK. Now when I do that, it shows up right here as a footprints brush. So what I can do is I can actually select this curve, and then I can come back over here and apply the footprints to it. And you can see that now the footprints are walking through the space. Let me go ahead and select all of them. We can apply the footprints to them. And we start to see, let me press Control-0 here, all of the little footprints. They're way too big in scale, so we need to change them down. So we'll select them, and we'll adjust my stroke. My stroke is maybe 0.1. Now that's too small. Let's try 0.2. There you go, something like that looks pretty good. And if we zoom in, you can see all those little footprints as the people are walking through. It's just a different strategy. Instead of using dots, we're actually using the footprints. The more paths that I have with these footprints on it, the more consistent and the more we're going to see how people are actually moving through the space. Does that kind of make sense? So that's a custom scatter brush. Um, all of these options are available on the course website. If you get a little bit lost, uh, just go to the tutorial section, go to Illustrator, and I have, let me see, where is it? There's scatter brushes. 
I have how to create art brushes too, but the truth is that most of the time you just use the presets. It's not really worth creating your own art brush, but you can. Uh, but I do talk about brushes in here. So if you want to go through any of those options, that's perfectly uh, reasonable. So that's a strategy for, for uh, essentially going through that. The last thing that I want to do is I want to remind you on the whole um, live paint tool. And this is more for your Charlie Harper than anything else, but it's worth the, the practice. So let's say that I wanted to do some fills here. I'm going to lock my paths for a second. And I'll start with an ellipse tool so I can draw the outside of the Pantheon like that. A little bit off. There it is. Let me draw the inside of it. There. Move this down just a little bit. I'm not going to take too much time when I draw these. So I recognize that they're not perfect. So I'm not, I'm not worried about getting everything to align perfectly. I'm just quickly going through and identifying some of the major uh, pieces here. OK, so if we were to look at all the stuff that I just did, oops, sorry, wrong button there. And for, let me turn it all off. There, there they all are. Let me change my uh, stroke thickness here so that you guys can see it. OK, so there they are. And again, I'm, I'm going rather quickly. The way that the live paint tool works, remember, I always suggest that you create a copy of the layer before you do the live paint, just in case. So I'll go ahead and create the copy. Let me go to duplicate layer. I will call this layer live paint. There it is. It's called Live Paint. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the original. I'm going to work on the Live Paint layer. You will select all of the objects in the Live Paint. There they are. I'll go up to Object, Live Paint, and then Make. The bounding box for the object changes. It has the little stars in the corner. That's my sign that I can use the Live Paint tool, which is hidden underneath the Shape Builder tool, or you can press K on the keyboard to get to it. And once I've done that, all I have to do is uh, select a fill color, there it is, and then fill in where I want to fill in. So I wanted to fill in there, I wanted to fill in there, and I wanted to fill in there. Once I'm done with those fill regions, I can go back to properties here. We can move on, we can leave it as is, or I can click on this expand button, which breaks it apart again. So I made the live paint, I painted, now I expand, that breaks it all apart. And that gives me access to each of these individual colored sections. So I can pull that out, I can pull that out, and I can pull that out. So it created those fill regions for me. So I just wanted to review Live Paint one more time because a lot of you did that with your Charlie Harper and you want to be able to fill things in. That's how you would do it, create your line drawing. Uh, I didn't worry, notice in this, that I didn't worry about the fact that these overlapped, but I did make sure that they overlapped. If this, for example, was too short, sorry, wrong one, if this was like that, this would fill in because it's not crossing the line. So if I went back and did a live paint of this one, object, live paint, make, live paint tool, when I go to fill it in, it's going to fill in that section. So I need to make sure that those actually do cross. OK, so I'll turn you guys loose today. I think I've, uh, I think I've gone through everything else that I need to do. You should have two diagrams today, but you should post them in the same post. So there's only one post for today, uh, but it should have both. If you spend all your time working on one, you've got about an hour and 20 minutes or so. If you spend all your time working on one of them, that's OK. Just turn in one. Uh, but use your time wisely. Get practice in. Make sure you understand all of these variety of concepts because you're going to end up using this long term uh, in Illustrator. It's one of the, the key reasons to use Illustrator in the first place. 
Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that you might want to know. Um, sometimes, I'll show you one more thing. Sometimes you're drawing a particular line. Let's say it's like that. I want to make sure it has no fill on it. I've drawn that line, and I want it to not be a perfect arc anymore. Uh, we can actually go into the effects menu, and we can go to the, um, sorry, I have to remember where it is. It's under distort. There we go. No, it isn't. Got to love it when you can't find what you're looking for. Ah, there it is. Distort and transform. It was just up above. Sorry. Not Photoshop effects. I need to be in Illustrator effects. My bad. Uh, distort and transform here. Uh, these allow me to distort or roughen a particular uh, line. So if I went to roughen, for example, we can, can choose. Sometimes it's best to choose uh, preview mode. I can choose how much. So I want it to really roughen. I want it to just, you know, roughen it a little bit, something like that. This looks a lot more casual than that perfect arc. So I can roughen it. If you wanted it to be smooth, you can turn on smooth, and the, the corners won't be jagged. If you want it to actually have points to it, you can turn it on that way. Uh, the detail, you can con control how many little squiggles happen over the course of your line. Uh, and when you're done, it is still that one curve. It just has made it a little bit more casual. Same thing if I went back in. Can you tell this is my like last Illustrator lecture, so I'm trying to dump everything on you at once, right? So I could take this. I could go back into that effect, distort and transform. I could go to zigzag, which is going to be a consistent little zigzag. Let's turn that on as a preview. Angle, 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 angle. Uh, again, I could choose to make it smooth, or I can choose to make it angled. The size is going to control how large those zigzags are. Ridges per segment. You know, what do I want it to look like? And do I want it to be smooth or not? So you can see you can create a variety of, of lines uh, just using that distort and transform. So it's just another strategy for your diagramming. And I think that's all I need to try to tell you. Um, so good luck. Let me know if there's something specific that you want to do. Uh, happy to try to walk you through how to do it. And I'll give you the, the balance of your uh, hour and 15 minutes or so to finish up those diagrams.